Welcome everybody, come on over. We're going to get started with our speeches. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Welcome to our Black Lives Matter pop-up event put on by the Racial Justice Coalition of the Democratic Women of McDonough County. We would especially like to thank all the people who supported us, gave us donations for this day. It's been a beautiful day in the park. We've had quite a few people through. We do have lots of free Black Lives Matter buttons. We would encourage you to please take some. And especially to our white allies, please wear them in this community. Wear them when you're shopping. Wear them when you go out to dinner with your friends. Let's start letting people know that Black Lives Matter is a humanitarian stance. It is not a political statement unless you're a racist. So we want lots of people to understand black lives matter and that's the discussion because black lives are at risk right now and we need to be doing something about that. So this first speaker I'm gonna bring up really needs very little introduction because I think most of you know her. However, Belinda Carr is our very first black woman elected to be chair of our party in the McDonough County Democrats. Woo! She is also the Director Emeritus from the Gwendolyn Brooks Cultural Center, which has now had several different name changes, but Belinda worked at WIU for decades, and she has been a resource in this community, has been helping people forever with these issues. We are so pleased that she could make it tonight. I promised to put her up first because she's got to drive to Chicago, but that's how dedicated she is. She came anyway, so let's give it up for Belinda Carr. with you, I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank the Racial Justice Coalition of the Democratic Women of McDonough County for their due diligence and persistence in putting before us the inequities found in our community. Their persistence has been a voice for those disenfranchised and marginalized by our system. I'd like for Heather or the chair of the Racial Justice Coalition, either one to come up. I want to present something to you from the 2020 Macomb Census Committee. Hey. Woo! Get your very own census bag with goodies. Woo! Census is our money and we want it back here. Yes, we want that money and all of you play a role in getting that for us in our community. I came to Macomb in the summer of 1976 as a non-traditional student. Like many of you, or many of the students today, I was a single parent raising two children, struggling to go to school. Oftentimes, I didn't have transportation, so I walked. And I lived in the housing for three years. And I walked from the housing to school for a whole semester because my raggedy car went out and I couldn't afford to get another one. <laughs> I call myself an advocate of the people for the people. I have spent my life working to help those that need that assistance. My mother was a person who instilled in me, you reach out and help others because you have, you can help them. And that's what I've always tried to do. Whether as a CASA volunteer, whether serving on the various Macomb commissions, McDonough County boards, or just working in the community to help our people. I enjoy helping people to improve the quality of life for all human beings. Yeah. Working together, all of us can accomplish that. 
Most recently, as Heather said, I was elected as the first African-American and female to chair the McDonough County Democrat Central Committee. Years ago, I had another first. I was the first African-American to serve on the McDonough County Board. Today, we're here to talk about the injustices experienced by African Americans and others in our community and around the world. The Racial Justice Coalition of the Democratic Women of McDonough County have persisted in their efforts to bring light to the inhumane treatment of African Americans in the city of Macomb. Because of their effort, people who have felt powerless have been given a voice. As a community, we have to come together. We can no longer tolerate acts of racism. We can no longer act as if racism does not exist in our community. That's right. Whether overt or covert, racism is alive and well today. What can we do about racism? Each of you have a role to play in eradicating racism and racist behavior. Stand your ground. Don't tolerate insensitive remarks. Yeah. Or more to the point, inhumane treatment of a fellow human being. our government leaders to first of all acknowledge the overt and covert racist acts and take a stand by speaking out against racism. If you're not happy with your elected leaders, what do you do? Vote. Vote. You go to the poll. If you're not a registered voter, you can go home tonight, get online and register. If you don't have a computer, no problem. Go to the courthouse tomorrow and register. And do you know you can even request your absentee ballot today? They will mail your ballot on or about September 24th. You can vote and do not have to go to the polls in the issues we're dealing with with COVID or the long lines, and you get your vote, you get your ballot. So exercise your voice. Politicians and elected officials, they understand the power of the vote. What they expect from us is that we won't go. We'll have all excuses, all kinds of excuses not to go to the polls. We need to show them we mean business. November the 3rd. Yeah. Make sure your voice is counted. If you want to ensure federal funding in this community to start programs that deal with racism, what do you need to do? Fill out that 2020 census. Get it done right away. Finally, I encourage you to meet your public officials. Share your concerns. Be a collective voice. As a collective voice, you have the power. And that power is in each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda Carr. Yeah. Our next speaker is also our very first black elected Alder woman at large for the city of Macomb, and also is the chair of our Democratic Coalition, which is our PAC for the McDonough County Democrats. And please give it up for Tammy Lee Brown Edwards. <laughs> I believe the stories of our 
citizen in Macomb and at Western. I've been disheartened by reading Black at WIU. I'm disheartened by the stories and affidavits that have come out of the Racial Justice Coalition. I appreciate their work in collecting those stories. I have, um, as Ms. Carr said, that you know, if you have a question or a problem, you should contact your elected official. I brought business cards, and I have plenty of them. So if you want to share them, if you want to post it online, you can do that. And I want people to know that I am going to be an advocate for you. That's the reason why I ran as an elected official. I want to be helpful. I want to be able to solve personal problems as well as um, social issues and racial injustice issues. And so I really want people to take it seriously. I don't want anyone to ever think that none of us on the city council is unapproachable. I post online all the time on Facebook. So many of you know who I am and how, do I, how I feel about certain things. And I would really want people to feel like I'm the elected official that you can come to if you are not comfortable with going to anyone else. Last thing I want to say is use your voice. Silence is complicity. So if you have to, you know, not be friends with someone you were friends with for 40 years because they see things totally different from you. You may have to do that. Sometimes people want to have a conversation and really want to know why you feel a certain way, but do not use your energy if it's going to affect you negatively. Do not expand, expend, expend that energy. Please take care of yourself. We're in a crisis situation. We're in a pandemic. Your health is important. You are important. You are valued. So if someone is going to drain you, do not let it happen. Always take care of yourself. So even though I'm asking you to speak out, sometimes you may have to, to preserve yourself, be quiet, but always, always speak your truth with you. If, 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 if possible, if it will affect, if it doesn't affect your health. I thank the Racial Coalition for asking me to come out. I, again, will have business cards. I'll be back in the back. My husband is back there with my son. My husband is, um, also an elected official who is with the McDonald Partnership. He and I are the first African American couple to ever be elected in McDonough County. So that's another first for us. And we're also, most people have been here many more years before they um, were elected in Macomb. So we're so glad that we've been able to um, create a community and friends and family who trust us and believe that we're going to do our best for everyone here. So thank you, and I appreciate you again for asking me. And again, I'll be in the back if you want business cards to share with other people, because I want to be the voice for you in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy Lee Brown Edwards. So we also want to let people know that with the Racial Justice Coalition, we have white allies ready to help anyone who needs a white ally to go into appointments or to speak to elected or appointed officials. Or if you feel like something, you're being told something that is infringing on your rights or doesn't sound right to you or is different than what you perceive somebody else in the same situation would be told, that's what we're here for. We are here to begin to try to work together to help, you know, there's some things we can't fix right away, right? Structural racism is going to take many lifetimes to deal with, but we know there's a lot of problems here that we could fix right away with the right people sitting in power and authority who would do the right choices yeah. at the right votes at the right time, which actually is now. And we must not give up our chance our opportunity to use this inflection point in our nation's history when we know black lives require white allyship. This does not get better with a lot more of us white people standing up and being the people that challenge our fellow, fellow white people doing wrong to begin to do what they're supposed to do to work together to make sure that all lives are protected. We want all people to gain access to the same privileges that we white people already have. And to those people who have said that we shouldn't be doing this as white allies, I challenge them to get up off of their couches and instead of giving lip service or bemoaning our work, to step up, show up, and, and talk to people because we're not making this stuff up. 
We do believe what people have brought to us. We believe that people's lives are in danger, that they've already been harmed. And we have a lot of restorative justice that we need to go after in this community. Our next speaker is over there, Dr. Essie Rutledge. And she has been in this community working on these issues now for over 42 years. And she is a professor emeriti of the Department of Sociology, and she is a sociologist. So I give you Dr. Essie Rutledge. Essie, can you come on up? I personally like to thank her too from the Racial Justice Coalition. Honestly, without her suggestions, her, her knowledge of Macomb, um, her wisdom, and all the decades that she has fought these fights without the white allyship needed to actually begin to address these things, we are so grateful that she has been so generous of her time and expertise. Here's Dr. Rutledge. is one that has included living in the South and living in the North. I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida. I went to school all of the years from first grade through college, undergraduate, in segregated school. And so I know and understand what racism is. But I'm afraid that so many people do not understand that. So often, people are upset when you, someone says you are a racist. Well, I want to inform that it is almost impossible to live in a society of racism is a part of our culture. It is embedded in the culture. And people learn it without being aware of it. And it is very difficult to be a white person and not know about racism. But it doesn't mean that because you know about it or that it exists, that it is easy for you to eliminate. But if we work together, we can. I have been really impressed since, and I hope, really don't want to say impressed, but I've been informed by people since the murder, let's call it what it was, a murder, the murder of George Floyd has brought about some things that are surprising, they have been surprising to me. And I do have a glee of hope, not only optimistic, but as long as I can hold on to some hope, it means that I'm not willing to give up and allow a racism to persist 
without doing something about it. I came to this community in 1976. And I came here as chair of the African American Studies Department at West. I can, when I came here, there was not one black female professor. When I got tenure, I was the first black woman to get tenure. When I made full professor, I was the first black woman to make profession. Now let me say this, I don't see this as something that is grandiose. Because if we think about the length of time that Weston has been in Macomb, and I had to be the first, would you think that I was 105 or 10 years old? <laughs> no, I'm not. It's just that those things that were insistent all over this country were also persisted at, in Macomb. Now, you may think that things have gotten better. Some things have gotten a little better. We thought when President Obama became president that that was going to be the end of racism. And in fact, People acted as if they thought it was going to happen. But it did. Some of the most foolish things were done and said about uh, President Obama that I had ever heard living in the South. And so when we think about that, how he was treated, how do you expect? with him having gone, having served his two terms and out. And I don't even know if Trump could bring him back, he would be happy about coming back. <laughs> but we can't allow those things to keep us from trying to achieve equality in this society. We needed people. I am so, have been so proud of the Democratic Women Coalition because of the fact in my years of being in Macomb, it's the first time that I know of an established group that was a front saying and doing things to give people of color, and particularly black people, because for the most part of these black people, giving them the support that they need so badly. We, we had, a, every time something arose that represented injustice, you know, we didn't get a little group together because there wasn't an organized group to do. The NAACP, when I came, had as president Leroy Daniels, one of the native uh, members of the, in, of the families, black families in Macomb. And he was working very hard to try to get of black people, jobs at the university. He was successful. They did get people who were working in janitorial services at Western as a result of Mr. Daniel's efforts. Nothing has happened. Then later, another member of this community Ms. Uh, Helen Thorpe, whose husband was uh, Bill Thorpe, the first black policeman in this community. 
Well, it ended up people had gone to her and and had uh, complained about not being able to get housing, about discrimination on the job. And so what happened, we ended up forming a committee of three. And that committee was called Composure Tenet. One of the, one a male in, in that group as well, and myself. And we went to city council every week, and we complained. So finally what happened was the mayor uh, gave the, uh, gave, it was a, uh, Forgive me. It was the uh, the mayor directed the attorney of the city, and that was the AG, directed him to come up with an ordinance and requested that I would be a part of that. So we got together, we developed an ordinance, and out of that came the Equal Opportunity Fair Housing Commission. And that commission got together, developed a, a, a process by which it would operate, and it was established as the group that people could go to when there was, or they felt they had been discriminated against. And so that was the first time in those years that I had been here that we had a group that could listen to those uh, complaints. And it, was, it worked very effectively. Very effective. But you know, as other things, oftentimes those who are in power find ways to eliminate or to undercut that which will benefit others, and especially others of another race. So the mayor at that time ended up getting rid of the commission where it, by it would be able to function well. And so that commission has not functioned very well since 2007. I was uh, the chair of that committee for about 11 years. Oh, and they were always after me. <laughs> Oh, my, my name appeared in the paper a lot of times. <laughs> but I really didn't care as long as I thought we were doing good. And one of the things that happened after the mayor did reappoint me, they ended up <laughs> changing the schedule for me. Can you imagine? Equal Opportunity Fair Housing Commission meeting only four times a year. And people not even being aware of how they make contact so as to be able to function. And it was eliminated because of it. And this is one of, one of those racist things that I had I, we had a case of a woman who had uh, filed a grievance against uh, an owner of, a, of the, uh, if he owned one of the, 
Okay. <clears throat> he uh, owned one of the nursing homes. And the nursing home had asked me, the administrator, to do a workshop for them on racism because they were having some problems with the employees. And I had done one for them. So what happened then? They asked me to do it for their employees. Well, what happened in that regard was uh, I told them I was a little reluctant because I was the chair of the Equal Opportunity Fair Housing Commission. And I didn't want anybody to see because of that, we are accused me of having a conflict of interest. I don't have conflict of interest when it comes to what is right and wrong. So um, what happened, I, I told them I would do it under certain conditions. Number one, I would do it as a person whose uh, job or profession was to do this kind of work. I said, so I would do this as a sociologist. Less than I will not charge anything. And generally when I've done this, you know, you get a little money for it. So I said, no, I won't I won't pay to the money. But if these people are interested in doing things to make for a better environment between uh, black and white people, I am willing to do nothing. But it caused me to not be reappointed to the uh, commission. That was the end of it. But that was okay. Because I thought that commission had done a good job up to that point. And so since they had, I was willing to take all of the negative uh, things that were said and done to me because I felt it did help somebody. Well, that was one of the major things. But another thing that happened in this community over and over again had to do with the police. Black students coming to Western from the Chicago area, they would come in, a lot of them would come in on the bus, I mean on the train. And when they would get off the train, they were stopped and searched because they were looking for drugs and guns. So that was a common practice. And to my knowledge, it still exists. Even in, since 2008. And I have measured this body for about five years ago. There was a person who was coming down on the train to take a class. And there were three people getting off this track. It was he who was black. It was um, a woman, a young woman who had a baby in a stroller. She was black. And she got on, they didn't talk to her. They weren't worried about her. And then there was a woman, a white woman, and a chick. And the white male, there was the white male who was the second to get off the, off the train. When he got off, they didn't stop it. When the white woman got off, they didn't stop it. And when the black male got off, they stopped it. And they asked him, he said, why are you stopping me? They said, well, we're looking for her. He said, well, you should have the wrong person. <laughs> but they directed him to go into the train station. And this was so embarrassing. Everybody 
had gotten off the train and sat me. And he was directed to go into uh, the train station. And when he got in the train station, I followed behind. And we were trying to find out why it what made you think. You know, he asked that I had drugs. But he said, you look suspicious. He said, well, well now, the other part of the story is the people that were there at the train were the, were the police with the canine. And it was about five different groups of them. And because they were that, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so what happened then? This, the, they said you look suspicious. He said with all those police, <laughs> with all those dogs, I sure was. I was looking around because I was wondering what had happened. Whether, you know, they had had somebody who had done something and they were there to apprehend them. But that went on and on and on. My students used to tell me all the time about how they would be stopped. And well, we, we went to see the sheriff who couldn't get a hold of the, of the chief. And we uh, let them know that that was a racist act, definitely racist. And I said to him, you know, if you're going to be racist, I hope you wouldn't, but if you're going to be racist, make sure you do it in a way that doesn't, that whereby it won't make you look so suspicious. <laughs> I tell you what, now you have went to each of those persons and asked them and questioned them and asked them to go into uh, the train station. It would have been so obvious to the arrest. So that is a practice that has gone on for years. In the community, we used to go to Walmart and black students going into Walmart of black people, they were followed by the St. Louis Clips. And so all of those are kind of things that are taking place. And I want you to know, I've got my share of discrimination, racism at Western. Western is not exempt from this. We have students, faculty, who have been approached and have had things done to them. And I think that might be one reason most of them don't get involved in this kind of thing because they feel that it will affect them. But some of us have to stand up and do what is right. We know that it's not going to be easy. And there are students who, and people in this community now who have been harassed by police and who have been treated unfairly. And they don't know who to go to. Well, that's what the them women have been able to do, uh, to provide them some allies. I have gone to workplaces, schools, you name them, with families who are here with their children 
who are not as versed and about the system as I am. And I have gone and been their advocate to support them because they didn't have anybody to do so. And I think we are at a point in this country and, and in this town where when we can get together and do things that will be supportive of those whose voice might not be as loud as yours. We need, as Heather pointed out, white black people need their lives. You, I want you to know that racism was started by whites. And if we get rid of it, we've got to get rid of it with whites being involved. And I know that it is not easy. I know it's difficult. You know, as you tell, say to some white people, you have white privilege. Oh, no, I don't. I don't. Well, they are really naive if they think they do not have because you do have white privilege. Even the, the lowest socioeconomic status white person has more opportunities and are treated better than a black person. All the police wants to see a bill out there trying to uh, find a black person to charge with something. See the color of their skin. And then what do they do? They'll stop it. That same kind of thing that happened to a white person, and they don't get the same kind of treatment. So, it's one last thing that I would like to kind of make you aware of, because I think many times people see this as being something so personalized and that they miss the pervasiveness of this behavior. And this is racism. I would recommend that you might consider racism in a way that I like to describe. And that is, you know, racism is like, it's on a continuum. At one end is the racial, really the racist bigger. On the other end is the liberal. But let me tell you, all of them have some racism. And it's because it is so embedded in our culture. You can't get around it. And therefore, one of the things that there were, you know, the most liberal, there were liberal people out there who were involved in trying to teach their children and trying to do the right things to help people. But they can't get rid of it over that. Because some of it, they don't, they are not even aware that it is racist. And I feel very strong about it you know, utilizing those teachable moments, there are times when people might say or do things that when they are unaware of the fact that what they said or did is racist. Well, this is the time for those of us who know what it is and have an experience it that every day can stop and say, okay, I want you to know, I want to let you know that that was a racist statement, that that was a racist thing. And I know you may not have ever thought of it, 
But if you start taking into consideration, greater consideration of what you might do or say, then that happens. You know, there were people who did not understand why we had indicated the signs that were put up by President Thomas indicated it was racist. It was like the lynch mob. And, and it was. But some people didn't think anything about it. And so we, those of us who are being oppressed, must make those who are the oppressors aware of what it is like to experience racism. And the racism is both covert and overt. You don't have to be uh, a trans person. You don't have to be a white supremacist. in order for you to be a racist. So let us help each other to try our best to come together. Because I think the group Black Lives Matter that has been out here in this park, those are people who are working, I believe, toward equal justice. And these are young people, old people, children. And that is something that has been very gratifying. These groups that have been together protesting, I have, in those groups, I have seen more white people than I have seen in marches and, and uh, protests my life, all my life. So I think that we have a chance to really bring about change. But we can't get lazy about it. We've got to get up and continue it. We've got to be consistent. Because that is the way we might be able to, to beat this beast out here that is destructive. There are still people who are almost being run over by people in cars because they don't, we have to assume, they don't like black people. These are black people that they are about to run over. So let's not be a part of the problem. But let us be a solution to the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rutledge. So let me just point out something to you about the Equal Opportunity and Fair Housing Commission. Last summer, over a year ago, our VP, Verna Parkins, and I went to the the commission, and because there wasn't hardly anything online about how it functioned, how people could access it, how they could get help, where the complaint form was, we went there to ask about it, and as soon as we wanted to ask basic questions, they closed the meeting down and said they couldn't even answer the basic questions. So the next day, I had a conversation with Scott Coker. It was his first week on the job. He informed me he had just learned that he was the affirmative action officer. So we asked for specific remedies. One of those things was that they would get the complaint form, they would put it up at City Hall and put it online. So the week before last, our other VP, Becky Danner, went in to find out how that complaint form's doing. She was told there's no complaint form, but if she wanted to come back a week later, maybe the people who knew where it was would be able to help her. And this is over a year later. We need this commission functioning. We have had so many complaints from black women that white male housing managers or apartment managers will just walk in on them when they're showering or in their bedroom in their underwear 
And when they try to complain, they're served a five-day eviction notice. Who are they supposed to go to for help if our housing commission doesn't want to meet except four times a year? And the only way you get to meet is if you went to the previous meeting months earlier to ask if you could be on that meeting. So if your housing's at risk, do you really have four months later to wait for your complaint to be heard? So then they're told now, well, you can just go in and speak to the affirmative action officer. Um, how many of us feel comfortable with our government? One, you might be, and this is not personal, right? This is talking about when the optics of having a wealthy white male being the funnel on gatekeeper on who gets their complaint heard is a problem, right? And that's a problem that could be fixed today and it shouldn't have existed. Now, Dr. Rutledge didn't bring this up, but back when she was on the Equal Opportunity Fair Housing Commission, we got it up and running and it was functioning well. And we had a great ordinance. I'm sorry, I can't speak well with that on because I can't breathe. Um, and it was functioning quite well. And that ordinance was actually checked through a civil rights attorney, um, Ron Jackson in Peoria. And then when they called, after she went and did that training for that uh, group, then Nick Wislin and then Alderman Dave Dorsett and then Alder Alderman Mike Inman put in a BS complaint against her with the state, complaining that she was um, violating, um, you know, that she was, there, there was an ethics issue there. They didn't tell her that they were complaining about her based on that, but she went through an investigation and then was told that she was cleared, but they still allowed a man who was reporting on it then, Pat Stout, um, to basically put out a news article that implied that she had possibly done some wrongdoing, even though she had been cleared from it, and they used that to strip her off the board. And then they put Pat Stout in his chair, and we discovered last year, and this is interesting, all these years that Pat Stout our local reporter had sat on that commission as chair. He was also being paid to report on it. So we wondered why the public record didn't reflect all the subsequent dismantling of the ordinance to, to lose all of its teeth and functionality to basically strip out what that commission used to be able to do for people. And now it is effectively not helping anybody. So, if you think that should change, call City Hall, tell them to get that commission functioning now. Put that complaint form online. We're a university town. They still can't have a basic paper form. Use a Google form if you need to. We put forth all of these solutions and we met with Mayor Inman, our Racial Justice Coalition leadership team, back in uh, December, met with Mayor um, Inman and Alderwoman Gail Carper, and we gave them our basic list of fixes based on the Southern Poverty Law Center suggestions for what communities like ours needed to do to begin making sure that all people had equal access to the protections, regulations, oversight, and accountability for wrongdoing of their local government. We didn't ask for anything special. We didn't want gold bars printed in our name. We wanted simple things like a website that actually works for people, right? That actually allows people to get help without requiring them to go up and speak to someone they may not feel comfortable speaking to. That's not how government's supposed to work. And that's not how it works effectively. And we can change that. We can change that. Okay, the next person I'm gonna bring up is someone who has experienced complete <laughs> her story i'm going to put a content warning on um, this young woman had no record prior to this um, she is disabled she is blind in one eye she was giving a young woman a ride and that young woman's mom who is an icu nurse um, came and interacted with them and saw no problems with ariel or her driving or anything, let her daughter go on, but yet she still was a victim of what we think may have been a case of fits the general profile. So somebody called in a complaint against reckless driving on a different vehicle. The police pulled her over. They 
brutalized her. Somehow she sustained a closed head injury that they never talked about in their report at all. Somehow the video for all that just isn't available even through FOIA. And then once she got to the jail, um, because she was asking why she was being arrested on a DUI that they couldn't make and a reckless driving that they couldn't make. So what did they get her for? For resisting arrest and for battery. Because they tased her at least four to five times to shove her in that cell. And when she was asking for help from the one white woman there that we think she was reaching out, they accused her of trying to harm her and justify tasing her and then leaving her unconscious for what may have been hours, hours in our jail with no medical attention whatsoever. And then when she was released, she, man she took photos of her injuries, thankfully, and managed to talk to one of our members about it who brought it to us. And her case is not unusual. We have taken dozens of complaints over the last year and a half of wrongdoing by our police and other people. Ariel, I'm gonna have you go ahead and come on up if you feel up to it. I want everyone to give her a big round of applause for her courage. She should not have been arrested. She definitely should have been saved. She should have been left unconscious in our jail with no medical attention whatsoever, with a closed head injury that never got evaluated. And now they're trying to railroad her to jail, to prison, during COVID, to cover up their mistake. I really believe that's how it is. And if I'm wrong, they need to prove it. So I give you Ariel Harrison. Hi guys, my name is Ariel Harrison. Okay. On October 26th of 2019, um, YMCA was having a, um, a Halloween party for the kids. So at the time, I was leaving a friend house down the street from YMCA. And she watched my other two youngest kids while I go get my daughter and her friend. And I live in River One. So as I was getting my kids ready for the Halloween party, I seen a young white lady, a white girl, coming um, in the rain. It was raining and wet outside, so it was dark. So I seen her, and I asked her, for, do she want to ride? She denied it, and I said, no, I'll take you and then bring you, you know, back home because it's dark and wet and raining outside. So I got in my car. When she got in my car, I asked her name. She said her name was Sierra. She said, as her age, she said she was 17, but found out she was 20. So as I took her where she needed to go, it was Taco Bell. So after I took her from Taco Bell, I took her to my friend's house to get the kids ready to walk, you know, get in the car or walk to YMCA. As I approached YMCA, I told my friend, because she watched my kids, as I leave YMCA, I go to Pierce Liquor Store to grab me two little drinks. And on my way from Pierce Liquor Store, from coming there, I uh, want to drop her back off at home at River One. I was at the red light on the turning single, making a left turn. Before I made that left turn, the police came the opposite way as he wanted to River Run, but he made a left. So he made that left, it, the, the light turned green. As I was turning, he came behind me but didn't see no light. As I was spent to go past University Street, his lights came on. So I stopped. He came to the car. My window don't let down, it's broke. So I opened my car. So he flashing the light in my eyes. I'm blinding my left eye. So I asked him, 
I can't see. I asked him, what did I do? And he told me to step out of the car. He smelled liquor. I said, I haven't been drinking. I just went to the store. He kept asking me to step out of the car. And I said, what did I do? I didn't do nothing. So two other cars came. They drew me out the car. They put me in the back seat. Now, as I'm in the back seat, I don't have any handcuffs on. As we go to the police garage, as we go to the police garage, I ask the same thing. I say, my kid, they had a party, what did I do? I said, I didn't do nothing wrong. They say, get out the car, Ariel. I said, I'm not. So I was resisting. I was sitting in the police car. They didn't call tapes. They just taped me. They kept tasting me, so they got me out the car. But this lady, oh man, police kept tasting me, and I was screaming, and, hey, what I do? After that, I don't really remember because I was knocked out. Cold. I woke up cold. I woke up, my legs were screaming, bruised up. I woke up with my pants all wet beside me. So I was scared and afraid. I had on. Um, trying to call out for help because I'm a man. I was cold. I was scared. Uh, so the police came. I was trying to get them attention. So I took the pants and you know, tried to get them attention and put it by my neck. It was a woman police and a male police came in. The woman police told me to take my clothes off. I said, if the man leave, I will take my clothes off. He's not going nowhere. I said, okay, the man had to taste him. They had to taste so I was afraid. I took my clothes off. They threw me the suit. After that, that's it. I was in jail for something that I then they placed me somewhere I didn't wasn't. They placed me somewhere I wasn't. I moved down to Macomb in 2015. I moved. I never had a background until I got here. Um, We estimate that there are dozens of our black community members and WIU students who have records they should never have had in the first place. They came here for school or for housing and they got mistreated and they couldn't find help for that. Now I'm going to put on my former paramedic and EMS instructor hat and let me just explain a few things, all right? Um, when a person experiences a period of unconsciousness and they are in custody of the police or EMS or the hospital or they are on government services or they're in the back of a police car, we are always obligated by law to get adequate medical help for them. What should have happened when she was rendered unconscious and we don't know how, they should have called an ambulance and she should have been taken to MDH. Instead, she was left unconscious there, disrobed. And the fact that her pants were wet, when people are rendered unconscious and they lose um, continence where they, where they have urine leakage, that is always a sign they were very seriously injured. That period of unconsciousness is a big deal and has never been investigated, and none of it was talked about in the report. They didn't account for all the taser marks. They never addressed the head injury or all the bruises. They didn't address the fact that they couldn't make the original reason why they even pulled her over. 
And then basically, and, and I would just say that Ariel's horrifying experience is not unique to our jail or our Macomb police. And you'll notice that they aren't calling up us or me a liar, right? The people who know. Because they know we're not lying about this stuff. Instead, they just want to talk about how we talk about it, right? They want us to be nicer and smile or speak positively about this community. If you had taken dozens of these complaints the way that our members have over the last year and a half, you'd be a little grumpy too at the obstruction at City Hall. But let me give you an example so you all know how people get treated by our city leadership. When our older woman, Tammy Lee Brown Edwards, a week ago from Monday, talked about how she had been treated with racist disrespect, not the mayor, no one on the city council bothered to ask her, oh my gosh, how are you? I'm so sorry that happened to you. Who was it? Let's talk it out. Let's not let this go. Let's have a special session. Let's make sure our entire community knows what happened and what we are all going to do together to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen anymore here. And all she asked for was an apology. She didn't get one. And then last week, still nothing. But she has at least as much power as they do, right? And believe me, she's a lot nicer to them than I am. That was the treatment that she got at our city council meeting. And then after her, older woman Gail Carper spoke up and just said, hey, if any of you have problems, just come talk to me. Just come talk to us. Is that helpful? Uh, the woman sitting next to you just said that there's a problem and you just blew it off. That's exactly it. It's part of the problem. Now, is Kiana here today? Okay, I wasn't sure if she was going to be able to make it or not. So what are the remedies? For one thing, we have Black Lives Matter buttons here. We hope everybody will take one. Please, if you are a white ally, wear it in this community. Wear it out to eat. Wear it shopping. Wear it when you go up to City Hall. Wear it when you go pay your water bill. And let's talk just a little bit about the structural racism that we have identified that you all can see as it's happening, okay? One of the things that we know for housing has been happening is when somebody gets pulled over by the police and it appears in police beat, all of a sudden they have a background check checked on them and even when that person's whatever complaint was thrown out for lack of evidence, and we do have many of those against black people here, it doesn't matter because by the time the court hears that and throws it out, They've already lost their housing voucher and had moved somewhere else. We have lost dozens of wonderful human beings out of this community because of the racism here. We have lost dozens of our black faculty, staff, and students because of the racism here. And we still can't get a lot of people in City Hall or our county government to even say the word racism. We need to talk about this. We can't fix what we do not acknowledge. And I would like to thank everybody for being here today. I'm gonna to ask you all, please take selfies holding our Black Lives Matter button, you know, banners. Please take selfies near, our, near all of our posters. Please walk through and read those. Please tell people, white people specifically, about how important it is that they all step up and begin talking about this stuff with each other and not just certain white people. We have to be willing to confront this in every venue. This does not get better until enough of us white people are all standing up together and fixing this, right? And we're here for it. Now, if you are an elected official or serving in the Democratic Party, I would like you to raise your hands right now. I want you to take a look around. We have several of our elected officials, county board members, precinct committee people here for you today, feel free to tell them what you have experienced, okay? They want to know. They're helping us work on this. Now I'm gonna ask, is there, do we have any of our Republican leadership here? We wanna give you a shout out. Okay, well maybe next time. <laughs>
So maybe next time. Anyway, thank you all for being here today. Um, let's see, just a couple other things. One of the other elements that we are seeing is police will call, will pull over people for a license plate light. And then, and you ready, do you wanna come up? Oh yeah, we do have one other person. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Do you wanna speak to? Okay, that's okay. I knew that. Come on. It's all good. All right. So I'm gonna bring up our, one of our organizers, um, Celeste Victoria. Thank you guys, thank you all for being here and a special thank you to the Democratic Women of McDonough County. Um, I grew up here and, re and not until recently have I ever felt like there was somebody, forgive me, uh, aerial story and then a kid I call a nephew come, came up to me and told me he's living so I'm a bit teary eyed, I cry about everything so don't worry. Um, <laughs> they are the first people to actually listen without prejudice, to actually listen and say hey we're going to do something and we believe you. So thank you guys. Um, when the Black Lives Matter movement first gained momentum, I was thinking to myself how can I make a difference? I'm in a small town that most people have never even heard of and now that we have a great bypass they drive past us. Um, then a woman went out with her son to show him that his life mattered and that he was important in how he could make a difference in his hometown. Our town is a standing reminder that we can make a difference. Our county was a part of the Underground Railroad. Many homes that are still standing today, including some of those that are in Macomb, still have those trailblazing paths underneath them. Do you think those people didn't have somebody telling them that they were wrong and what they were doing wasn't right? For normalcy, for to have normalcy of change, we have to hear those difficult things. We may not have the big police brutality that you see in larger cities, but there is injustices happening. There is racism happening. Grown men being allowed to grasp children and call them coons and mongrels. Police pulling over black high school students for loud music while a white student with a loud tricked out truck barrels by. Lastly, an elderly white man pulling onto the wrong lane of the highway just to yell at people quietly protesting. These are examples from this community that I experienced firsthand. Um, during our time protesting, we had many mortars taunting us. We even had some that would drive by with their trucks and douse us with black smog. All while the MPD stayed in their vehicles watching and not doing anything about it. This shows that we really are not protected to use our rights. Recently, Deputy Chief Burnham has reached out to me to see the threats that our protesters have seen, and I hope that there is real change that comes from all the screenshots he, re he received. And if you have received anything, send it to him so he can see, hey, there is a problem in the community that you're protecting. This community blossoms when we bring in other people's children for schooling. We constantly are preaching, make it Macomb and a hometown touch. But when these children give you evidence of a not so friendly community and you tell them that they're wrong and so many people write into the city council saying, hey, these are just lies, that is the equivalent, at least for me, to believing a rape victim deserved it. In my 30 years of being here, that is exactly why I have never reached out for help because I didn't feel like anybody would listen to me. It's why my parents had to tell me how to be safe here, where not to go, to be home before dark and to always wear tennis shoes in case I needed to escape from somewhere that wasn't safe. We now have people in the community that feel so privileged that they can threaten Black Lives Matter protesters freely on social media, promoting to run people over and one of my favorite quotes, let's get this little war over with and get back to normal. But there's no issue, right? You're arrested. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I encourage anyone that has felt discriminated in this to come forward. There are people listening now. There are people fighting for us now. And I know that it may be difficult, and even if it was from years ago, everyone deserves a chance to have healing for what they've suffered. And even though the road is rough, if we do it together, it won't seem as long. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come up and speak? This time is for you. We have an open mic here for you. You have every right to speak your truth in this space. Come on up, Dana. You need Dana Walker. He's a precinct committeeman for the Democratic Party of McDonough County. Okay, real close to it. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, come up yet because I got here late, but uh, 
I think uh, job number one is to get rid of our racist President Trump in November. <laughs> Other number 18 needs to go against him. I have a question too. Uh, do we have a time for the uh, march on uh, August 7th? Not yet, so we'll announce it. All right, I'd like to hear about that. And uh, also, I made a comment uh, how the people arrested that made those threats. And uh, what they did was an assault. If they can be identified, that's assault. That's a law. It's a, it's a crime. They need to be arrested for it. I agree, but again, we have some police officers who we have credible allegations with the Illinois Attorney General of them assaulting people, and the police did nothing about that. So it made us wonder, well, are the Macomb police going to do anything since they've done nothing about all the people harassing the protesters? There's something else you should all know. During one of those protests, there was a really upset white guy wearing his personal armor and his Blue Lives Matter flag, and parked over at family video, presumably armed, um, standing there back and forth, being all enraged. The police did nothing. They did nothing. Thank God he didn't pull out a gun and just decide to kill everybody, right? How fragile of a white person must you be to get so upset at a bunch of women and children holding up cardboard signs with words on them, right? You gotta wear your personal armor for that. Now, one of the threats that I took personally was somebody calling himself a patriot, saying I better not go after the police because they're the only thing protecting me from him, from a patriot. That's the kind of stuff we have. We have people threatening to use their trucks to drive over our protesters. And we did give those screenshots to WIU's police department, and we asked them to investigate because we know they are obligated by law and right to investigate. And I will clarify in all the complaints we took, we took no complaints at all about WIU Office of Public Safety. Every one of them were Macomb PD's leadership, a few of the guys at the top, right? A couple, the sheriff and some of the deputies, and then some auxiliary people and the ride-alongs that they like to have. Now, should police be having ride-alongs who participate in violating people's rights? No. Um, I think there should be a log. I think everybody should know who rides along and why. And there's a lot of, uh, another other things that we can perceive and be aware of. Um, we have, we used to have all of our contracts with our vendors for the city and WIU used to make sure that they adhere to equal opportunity, fair um, justice, right, fair opportunities for hiring. The city quietly did away with any appeal of that, and now they just tell people, well, if you're black and can't get hired um, by our contractor, I guess that's just tough. Go put in a complaint with human services over it. Um, no, every one of our vendors and our largest vendor was one of the guys who got those signs and took them around and tried to convince people to put up the fire jack signs. Our largest vendor for both WIU and Macomb, and I won't say the name, but we have people willing to testify that he pressured their business to try to put up one of those fire jack signs, and he's never apologized, right? And that's a business that our black members have told us won't hire their laborers. And so we have a problem with our contract hires for the city of Macomb, and I hope you all start looking at those, because that's our tax dollars, and if they won't hire our black workers from here, forcing them to leave their families, they have to go travel to Peoria or Chicago or St. Louis to get hired, so they're out of the community, away from their families during the entire week, because they can't get hired locally or to work over at WIU. This stuff is unacceptable. We need to fix this. It didn't get this way by accident because it was fixed a couple decades ago and then they unfixed it. And that's the real truth. We used to have the same thing at WIU. They used to scrutinize every vendor contract. Why? Because that's taxpayer dollars. You're paying for that. You're paying for that. I'm paying for that. We have every right to know that our vendors who receive our tax dollars 
are actually treating people with the very basic of civil and human rights. We're not even asking them to be great employers, right? We're just asking them to follow the law. But as it turns out, Western sometime over the last, who knows, their leadership decided, you know what? That's too much trouble. If people have complaints, they can just contact the Department of Human Services and file a complaint. If you can't get hired for a job, can you wait six months to three years for your complaint to get heard at one of those agencies? So that's another leg of the issue. Over at our school district, we have been asking for black teachers year after year after year, decade after decade, I know our black community has. Oh, it's too hard, or we're not finding people qualified. Give me a break. This is an educational institution. All right, if the people in charge find their jobs too difficult, it's time for us to get different people elected and appointed to those positions who won't find that challenge too difficult to even try. So that's kind of where we are at this point. I would like to thank all of you for coming here. I am gonna ask a personal favor. Um, I need help getting all these posters back. So if you all could just stack them up near that black SUV over there so I could load them and we need help carrying tables and also the donation jars back. Um, thank you all for coming today. Thank you for those of you sharing your brave stories. You, you all are really um, appreciated. And I, on behalf of the Democratic Women of McDonough County and our Racial Justice Coalition, I would just like to say thank you to all our allies and our elected officials and all who participated in this. This event we're hoping to bring to every small community in our county to begin teaching people how we must move forward together. We cannot be a healthy community. We cannot have an economically viable engine to run this community if we allow certain groups in our community to have their civil human and constitutional rights violated without any, any accountability whatsoever. So we are here not because, you know, I, I'm going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt that they're all good people if they're in there. That's fine, right? This is not about what kind of people we are sitting there. This is about what the people in those positions could be doing about these things and for whatever reason are not. And if you would like to run for office, I would encourage all of you to do so. We have tons of seats that need good people in them. I promise you, you will, you will receive the training that you need. But if you have a good heart, a willingness to listen, a willingness to develop broad discussions, and to truly begin to get at the underpinnings of how our community has such a terrible reputation nationally, I mean, the, the city council meeting after that article came out in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, they didn't plan on discussing it. Um, our community was called racist in the premier uh, journal for all higher ed in the United States and our mayor and our city council didn't feel like it should be mentioned. They acted like they didn't even know that it had happened. And I'm just telling you that if I'm a mayor and an article like that appears about my city, I would be ashamed. I would be disgusted. I'd be calling everybody up that week and saying, get your butts in City Hall. Let's talk about these problems and let's get over and talk to the people who are suffering these and find out what they think we should do about it. And then let's get together and do it. That's what a leader does. A leader doesn't say, let's get together and have white people discuss their feelings about difficult topics. What good has that done for this community? Not a single thing that we have asked to be fixed has been fixed yet. We are still taking complaints of vehicles threatening black people here. So please, if you're a white ally, be watching for this. One other thing that we need everybody who's white in this city to do, pick up our planning commission and city hall and tell them we need a sidewalk over there going out to Walmart so that our people are not walking in that street. We have to have too many of them almost get hit and be traumatized and terrified. And then when they try to make the police take a report, 
The police refused, except for the few people who forced them to, and then they got retaliated against for putting in a complaint. And all of those things I've mentioned are all complaints that are in the Illinois Attorney General's office where they are investigating. They have opened an office on East Jackson. It is just two buildings down from the north side of East Jackson, right uh, just two buildings east of American Family Insurance. You don't have to go through us for your complaints. We are happy to assist you and to be white allies. Um, you know, that's, that's no problem, but we don't want anyone to feel like you have to go through us. You can go directly to them or if you'd like someone to sit with you and explain the forms to fill out, we will help you file those complaints. And to those saying that we should have gone through City Hall, we did try. We tried with letters, we tried meeting with them, we tried asking nicely. The town halls, the letters to the editor, the news articles, they haven't responded to a single concern. Not a single concern has been addressed. Maybe they just don't like the way we're approaching them, huh? Well, what about all the other groups that have approached them and they still haven't fixed anything? So there's a lot of work that we can do. None of it is really very hard as long as the people in charge have the will to do it. A lot of it's very simple things that would take 10 minutes of a webmaster doing it, but they still aren't. So anyway, thank you all so much. If you wouldn't mind bringing the flags over here, we'll break them down, let everyone, we have one more. Oh, you wanna come up and speak? Yeah, we got I don't really have much to say, but we have another protest planned next Wednesday on the 22nd from 3 to 7, so if you would like to come, we'll be up here on the corner. Just make sure that you bring a mask, and we'll have plenty of signs available and water and sunscreen. Thank you. Uh, I didn't plan on saying anything here today, but my, uh, my partner was driving four weeks ago, three weeks ago, and my my car says, women against Trump. <laughs> so a police officer stopped him and said he was talking on his thumb. He, uh, he's an old man. <laughs> he does not, he's got a flip thumb. He does not talk on his thumb. So he said, he told the officer, well, just check and see, check my minutes.
Hi, um, I'm not the most eloquent. We've had some really wonderful speakers today who have made some really powerful speeches and have such a way with words, and I'm not that experienced, so, uh, you know, bear with me, but uh, I just had a few things that I wanted to say, and it's, uh, uh, if you can't tell by my everything, I'm, I'm um, pretty uh, radical. I'm a queer punk. That's how I consider myself. I'm sexual and trans, and uh, I'm very far left. And uh, I, <laughs> but, and even though I am not what uh, the cops would be most friendly to, I also want to say I do have quite a lot of privilege. As you can tell, I'm very white, and I come from a, a pretty middle-class family. And what I wanted to say is that racism embeds itself even in minority communities. Even in the gay community, you see people on their dating profiles that say, no fats, no fems, no blacks, no Asians, no Hispanics. And when you call them out on it, they say it's just a preference. Why is that your preference? Even though it is hard to be trans in rural America, it is even harder to be black and trans, indigenous and trans, Asian and trans, Middle Eastern and trans, Muslim and trans, Jewish and trans. It seems like every day we hear about another woman, another black trans woman who is killed under mysterious circumstances, whose case will most likely go nowhere. Even now, many people in the gay community do not know who Marsha P. Johnson was, who Sylvia Rivera was, two trans and women of color who were there at Stonewall. They do not know who Stormy Galarve was, a black lesbian who threw that shot glass at the mirror when the police came to raid their place of safety, their place of solitude. I am angry, and I think I am rightfully so, that people in my community are still discriminated against in their place of refuge. And I want you to remember their names. I want you to know that even now in the year of our universe 2020, the average life expectancy for a trans woman of color is 35. I want you to remember Tony McDade, a black trans man who was killed by police and whose case was did not use his dead name, used to, to, to talk to him as a, I'm sorry, I'm getting flustered, but spoke of him as a woman, even though he was very far along in his transition and passed very well, and even if he didn't, why should that matter? Exactly. Even in this community, there is racism. Even with women who should be standing together, there is racism. Even in the trans community, there is racism and sexism. And I have faith in the young generation. I have faith in people my age because we are angry. We are all angry and I know that we are going to use the anger to do something great. We are going to use the anger to make a change. We are going to use the anger to get out in the world and fight for our black and indigenous and brothers and sisters of color. And that is why I say black lives matter. And that is why I say defund the police and reconstruct it and reform it because we need it. Because in 2020, people are still judged by the color of their skin. Because in 2020, if I go to the Walmart with my friends of color, I won't get followed, but they will. Because in 2020, the ethnic hair supplies still have uh, security tags on them and more surveillance than the stuff that sells L'Oreal. I am mad because racism embeds itself into even minorities. I am mad because it embeds itself into consumerism, into our books, into our, even our ways of speaking. Soul down the river, whipping them into shape. Where do you think that those come from? I am mad, and I hope that I can use that anger as fuel, and I hope that I can make a difference and continue to unlearn ideas that I have learned by being in such a country for so long. I'm so glad I was able to be here today. And thank you to the brave women who shared their stories of brutality and who shared their experiences and shared 
all that they had to change, whatever is going on still now. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. Have a good night, everybody. Please help us carry everything over to the black SUV.